Family violence is a critical issue in Aboriginal communities across Canada. This traditional talking circle includes three elders, an RCMP member, a child protection advocate, and a Crown prosecutor. Each of these people were asked to speak about family violence and the criminal justice system. You cannot undo what Canada calls history. We have our own history too that's never been written or taught, and it's a beautiful history. Prior to European contact, children formed the center of the Aboriginal community. Surrounding those children were the elders who would teach them. Around the elders were the women who tended to the home fire. And it was the men who formed the outside circle. They were the warriors, providers, and protectors of the entire community. I think back of our culture before European contact. Everybody had a role in a family. There was rites of passages for the boys and girls and responsibilities, everything. Such beautiful teachings. As European people settled in what is now Canada, they sought to impose their system of land ownership and resource development. But the Indians were in the way of their relentless march towards civilized settlement of the land. The European settlers held certain assumptions about Indian people. They were savage, heathen, uncivilized. The Royal Proclamation of 1763 recognized Indian nations but positioned them under the protection of the crown, creating a process whereby Indian land could be controlled by the imperial government and purchased by settlers. In 1830, attempts were made to reclaim Indians from a state of barbarism and introduce them to the industrious and peaceful habits of civilized European life through religious knowledge and education. The Indian reserve system was imposed and tribes were provided houses, barns, churches, and schools. Here's this ex powerful external force that's armed, that comes in and, and presumes to impose its understanding and its values. And you look at its track record, and you look at the history of colonization and the destruction of community through those very institutions, and you, it cannot succeed. In 1842, the Bago Commission conducted a two-year review of reserve conditions. It concluded that Indian communities were only in a half-civilized state. Another commission in 1856 concluded that any hope of raising the Indians as a body to the social and political level of their white neighbors is yet a glimmering and distant spark. It was concluded that the policy of civilization needed more drastic measures. In 1857, the Gradual Civilization Act was passed so that Indian men could become free from the status of being an Indian, awarded 50 acres of land, and become a full British subject. In 1867, the Constitution Act gave legislative authority over Indians and their lands to the federal parliament. In 1876, the Indian Act was passed. 
moving forward an explicit agenda of assimilation of Indian people into Canadian society. That agenda was accelerated into high gear with the establishment of the residential school system. In residential school, I learned how to survive that system. I learned how to cheat, manipulate, steal, fight, everything. The residential school plan was straightforward. Remove children from their family and re-socialize them to Canadian culture and society. Children were taught a new language basic labor skills, and Christianity. They lived at the schools and away from the influence of their culture. The residential schools were operated under contract between the federal government and numerous church organizations. The schools were underfunded, mismanaged, and poorly monitored. I remember crying from September to February every night, crying, missing my family. And they were alcoholics, <laughs> you know, but they were my alcoholics, my family. Eh? Finally, in February, I decided I'm not going to cry anymore. I'm not going to cry anymore. You know, it was feeling abandoned, really feeling abandoned. Children were punished for speaking Indian languages. Their hair was cut, and each child assigned a uniform and number. Many children were physically and sexually abused. They were taught to be ashamed of being an Indian. Many children would return home over the summer and be unable to speak their language. Soon, they viewed Indian culture and ceremonies as heathen and savage. When I think about the violence in residential school, when kids were being beaten, they stood at, with their arms at their side and they kept their eyes down. It's a way really kind of giving the finger, you know, I'll, I'll be blasted if I'm gonna let you make me cry, you know? So they built a wall around themselves. That was such a good thing to do at the time. It was important that it happened. Either that or kill somebody else or kill yourself, you know? In 1913, Indian agents reported that residential school students returning home were becoming stranded, disconnected from their communities, as well as the growing Canadian society. They went back to the community and didn't fit in. They couldn't speak the language. They didn't understand the traditional teachings and emerged a child that was in conflict with themselves. As the years passed, the first generation of residential school students eventually became adults and then parents. The shame associated with being an Indian was passed on to their children. Multiple generations grew up this way, entering adulthood with little understanding of who they were. The protective barrier once provided to children by the family and community had shattered. A lot of people in my community feel a deep sense of shame. So walking somewhere in the middle of trying to find out who we are, and with that deep sense of shame and helplessness and hopelessness, it's very difficult to navigate your way through a healthy lifestyle. It was instilled in us as young people that we were never allowed to cry, we were never allowed to share our feelings, we were never allowed to tell the secrets that happens within the walls of our home. I was extremely influenced by all my cousins, you know, uh, my friends and everyone else in the community who, you know, had 
their own addiction issues with alcohol and drugs. When I heard about Native spirituality, I only heard bad things about it. It was all about like bad Indian medicine and putting curses on people. I was taught that it was wrong. You know, you grow up, see all this physical violence that don't seem that bad because you know what? They're giving each other black eyes and the next morning they're laughing about it. So, you know, just having developed that mentality for myself really normalized it. So the innocent person as a child somehow has become a perpetrator as an adult. This is why we have the problems we're facing today. It's an intergenerational issue. There are over 700 First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities in Canada, many of which could be considered remote. These communities are often small, tight-knit, and usually have one store and one gas station. So you go to the post office and you get to say, you know, hi to the guy that fixed your car. You get to say hi to the, you know, the person that lives down the street. You know, you get to run into your cousin and ask him for the 20 bucks he borrowed last week. You know, it's a, there's a real sense of community in everything that you do. Like this glass house, everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows what's going on. Could you imagine being a grandfather like my dad is right now and like how my grandfather was taking that right away from him to go and teach his grandchildren? What, what's, who's he gonna teach? Who's he gonna share with? So people never learned how to nurture, how to love, how to care. So then you're out there just fumbling around trying to cope with life and you don't have the tools. My dad, was an alcoholic. It was a lot of like pain and grief and trauma and you know, a lot of different things uh, happening within my household that I never knew how to deal with at the time. I remember always having to pack a little garbage bag and I had to put all the clothes I could possibly fit into this little white bag every Friday or every Thursday when something big was gonna happen. If my dad was gonna go and party, my bag would be packed Thursday before I'd go to school, so when I get home from school, my bag would be there ready. We had full-scale alcoholism. You know, drugs really started coming into the community. The elders, they talk amongst themselves, and best that they can recall during that era, there's probably maybe two women in our community that weren't alcoholic. Our community has had a world of hurt inflicted upon it, and a lot of people reacted by hurting each other. And it was a, a real norm to, to see a, a lady walking around with a black eye before, or a fat lip or something. It just wasn't even talked about. Nobody would even say nothing. It was just the way it, it was. We experienced having to run away and hide in the bush and sleep out, you know, because our mom had to be away and being afraid that somebody's going to come and sexually abuse us because she always said, you know, you always have to be aware. It's uh, the truth, you know. As we know uh, what we saw. Although the residential schools closed in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, children continued to be removed from their families, but this time by child welfare. And having their, their homes burnt down to develop, you know, a recreation area and meat racks being plowed down by bulldozers so that they could build a coal mine you know, there was so much hurt and trauma inflicted upon the community. It was like, you know, somehow out of that, maybe our community internalized the belief that we really weren't very important. With no traditional ceremonies to heal the layers of trauma, the despair stays bottled up inside. As the powerless seek power. The shame become angry. The anger explodes into rage. Power becomes control through violence, taken from those closest, the family. Things got really hard. I, I had witnessed my mom have a suicide attempt before, uh, when I was in grade four. 
So, yeah, I attempted to commit suicide and at the age of 14. Of course, under the influence of alcohol, I said, you know, um, there's no way I'm ever going to live through that again because my mom was running to the room to take the pills, so I beat her to it and I grabbed all the pills I can and I took them. My brother was like freaking out and he's on the phone with the ambulance and they're telling him not to let me sleep and my brother's like trying his best to keep me awake and like I guess that's I guess I could say that's a moment that I actually knew that my brother actually like cared for me and um loved me I guess. I think we've gotten very good. Someone calls 911 and there is a crisis response and it happens. But we forgot how to prevent that crisis from happening in the first place. The unfortunate part about my story is that uh, I landed up in a residential school at five years old and lived in that system for 11 years. You can name any abuse you want. I suffered through that in that school, including sexual abuse. Difficult to talk about uh, a lot of these things. But you know, um, the reason I talk about that is that uh, a lot of times uh, we're told, you know, that uh, forget about residential school. It's history. It's been over with. Forget over it. Well, uh, you'll never get over it. You talk about domestic violence and that. Well, that's where I, that's what I was educated with. And that's what I brought into a relationship. All that violence and hate and anger I went through in that residential school, that's exactly what I brought onto my relationship. You know, and I hate myself for it because I hurt the one that I love the most. George, your, your, uh, your openness and your tears are very moving and very important. And what it puts me in mind of is how the, uh, just call it the Western European or the white man's justice system, approaches uh, domestic violence or violence which occurs within a family and a community, when someone speaks openly about it, what they've done in the eyes of the justice system, if they've made an admission, and that's evidence, and it can be used against them. It's a cold, very analytical process where the facts are analyzed. We're expected to proceed, to prosecute. If it was the dad, you know, the mom and the kids had a struggle financially. The breadwinner was gone off to jail, no support. They weren't getting any sort of counseling. The dad was labeled the bad guy, thrown in jail for a while. Supposedly, you know, he was supposed to pay his debt to society. They had to go away and they sort of just disappeared from the community. So many times, you know, we go back to the same houses. We deal with the same people day after day. We come in to help clean up the pieces. We're focused on making the arrest. We're focused on prosecuting the bad guy. The concept of just taking people, throw them in the clink, okay, yeah, we've made the community safe. Well, they gotta be released. If they don't receive any healing there, we know for a fact that they're only being made to become worse, right? Then we turn around, release them on the streets, and we say, yeah, we did a good job. Well, guess what? All hell's about to break loose, right? First Nations people were all blamed for it. 
Well, it's your own fault. It's your fault you're in that mess. But yet, it's government policy, it's government legislation, conditioning of what the communities are today that started from when my friend was in residential school. To me, there's something wrong with this picture and this society that allows that to continue to happen. When, uh, when Kim mentioned the, 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 the looking for the bad guy, that's, that's the, the idea of singling out the individual, finding a way to, to blame them and separate them from the community that they belong in. That's not justice which, which brings the community together. That's not justice which achieves healing. That's justice which continues the, the, the cycle of alienation, violence. It's, an, it's, it's further violence. The challenge that we've been under is that we actually, through our justice system, encourage conflict through divorce, separation, restraining orders, peace bonds. So we have all of these laws and processes in place to separate people. What we don't have is a full understanding of who we're dealing with. <laughs> We recently did a research project in our community. It was looking at traditional legal principles. And our elders identified over and over again that people that hurt other members of our community need to be held accountable for what they've done. But just as important, they need the opportunity to reconcile what they've done. As you hear the elders always saying, we're going to deal with this in a good way without the ridicule, without the ostracization, because they're still family. You don't leave them out in the cold or you don't let them go hungry. In the late 60s and early 70s, there was a movement that started. Part of that movement was because there was a lot of criticism, a lot of media attention, a lot of shame around drunken Indians. Aboriginal leaders started to think about what do we need to do to restore the health of our communities? For the Staelis people of southern British Columbia, Healing began in the 1970s. At that time, you know, it was really noticeable in our community that our men were not fulfilling their roles as speakers, as leaders. Our men had to learn how to speak again and take their right for all. And our women, being the matriarchs, and knowing how to go and find the people to teach us how to walk with us again. And we started to learn. But it's always a, a blessing when we follow the spirit, who we are as a people, the people of the land. Decades ago in Hinton, Alberta, the women of the community were joining together in order to make life safer for their children. I was lucky in the 70s that I got to be really involved with the Native Women's Society here and some very, very strong women. You can take the alcohol and the drugs away, but if you don't deal with the underlying issues, it's always going to come back to haunt you. The six small communities that make up the Asiniwichiwinuwak Nation began taking their first step towards healing. I got to meet this really wonderful group of elders and they would say things like, we need to forgive one another. We need heal from all of these things so that our children can have a better life, our grandchildren can have something. The Asini Wichiwinuwak Nation and the Hinton Friendship Center formed a unique partnership with the justice system. 
This partnership diverted community members charged with sexual assaults within their family away from jail and into a program called Mamwe Wichihitoin. Mamwe means all together. Wichihitoin is a more sophisticated word, but really it means is like how we relate to one another. So we do incest-based offenses with sexual offending, but we do physical, mental, and emotional abuse as well. It's all covered under that umbrella. The treatment model was really unique in the fact that it looked at the offender as part of a family unit. You know, his spouse would be offered therapy, his children would be offered therapy, so anyone related to that family unit would become part of treatment program. You've engaged communities into healing from huge, huge trauma, you know, from generations of trauma. And you have, you know, elders talking about it. You have kids that understand that it's not okay anymore, like, and those are huge successes. For the Staelis community, Healing means reclaiming their teachings, stories, and songs. I absolutely believe that our culture, our traditions, your knowledge of who you are and where you kind of come from is going to be the foundation or the strength of whatever we do as far as healing. The Staelis community has developed a number of programs that deal with historic trauma. One of those programs is called Talalam, a house for families at risk of having their children taken away and put into the child welfare system. The family stays together in the house while working on their issues. The straight translation for Talalam is the home, the house, and the family comes in and they come in as a unit. It's not just the healing or fixing of that one part, it's the healing and the fixing of the whole family unit, the whole circle. And in every house they have these tables where when there's any kind of business, people are called to the table. The secret ingredient of Tulalam was the community connectedness because as Holmuch people, native people, we never stand alone. We rely on one another and you're stronger when you're a big family. And sometimes it means a whole lot more work, but that's our culture. So in the late 60s, early 70s, Native Counseling Services of Alberta, like many other new organizations, decided to take on these issues and started to advocate for elders and spirituality within our correctional programs, and eventually got involved in running our own institution. So through that, we started to address historic trauma through what we call In Search of Your Warrior. So when we talk about implementing restorative practices from a traditional perspective in Canada today, there's this view that it's almost a get out of jail free card. That there's a, an easy way if you go the Aboriginal way to dealing with crime. The easy way is to take someone out of the community and put them in a federal correctional system. If we look at a restorative process, that's harder than any jail time. It's hard when you have to look back at your life all the way to childhood and say, what happened to me? That's hard work. Emotionally, spiritually, mentally, when you have to sit with your victim, your family, your community, your elders, and talk about what happened to you. That's a tough journey. Recently, Native Counseling Services of Alberta's Warrior Program was adapted for youth and called Tapwe Warrior. Tapwe is a Cree term meaning the truth. I got accepted to do the first Warrior Program. I didn't know what to expect or anything about the program. I, I wanted a three-week vacation. <laughs> I heard about journals, I heard about sweetgrass, I heard about, you know, just Aboriginal 
culture, and it's something I've never learned about. So we got involved with uh, Native Counseling Services of Alberta, but they provided us with training and allowed us and created a space for us to share stories. It was a scary time because it was the first time I've ever opened up to anyone. I didn't even have any idea on how to heal. One of the biggest things that had an impact on me is the family tree. When you do the family tree, there's a legend that comes with it. And this one was like alcohol abuse, drug abuse, substance abuse, divorce, death, separation, family violence. And like each one's a different color, a different line. And I was like, these guys must be crazy. They think I'm gonna like share this about my family. I filled it in. I almost looked like a rainbow. <laughs> like, you know, it was a shocker to me. It's just like, boom, this is why you are the way you are. Knowledge is power. And when you give people information about family violence and trauma, they can start to see how that plays out in their own community. You know, it starts to break down the denial. It starts to break down, you know, some of those barriers. So the question we have to ask ourselves within Canada, do we want to continue to spend the hundreds of millions and billions of dollars on the Aboriginal problem? Child welfare, policing, corrections, justice. We need to rethink how we invest in our communities and community building, community healing. That's what we did with the Tapo Warriors because we've created healthy young leaders that are able to shape the future. I definitely found my inner warrior and healed myself from the inside out. And I feel like that played a significant role in where I am now and where I want to be. I'm now having a, a child of my own. I'm going to be a father for the first time. And I'm just grateful that I'm given the opportunity to get them exposed to different things that I was never exposed to when I was a kid. We're all very, you know, unique people. We're all, you know, our own individuals, and we all have a story behind us. You know, I went to youth conferences as a kid. I never thought I would be the guy on the stage. I never thought I would be the person telling these kids that, you know, it's all right, you know, like, you're not alone. We had our 10-year anniversary here last year for the program, and it was magical, because there were people who got up and talked about the program and what a difference it made in their lives and their families. Is that baby Louie? Yeah. yeah. I thought, this is what we work for. You know what I see? Where I see the difference in our communities, I see it in our kids. And they're just happy. They're not burdened by, you know, generations of abuse. You know, they're sort of breaking free from that. And um, I see young parents raising beautiful, happy kids. You know, that's I know where we're making a difference. My journey has led me to a place where I realize that the only way we can move forward is for the justice system to somehow absorb and learn the traditional ways My grandfather described it before he had passed. He said, son, it's time to share our beliefs and our laws. And for far too long, our people, our elders, because of all of the dark era, the suppression, the being punished, being put into residential schools, they kind of hid those things away and um, stopped telling some of the real history on the land and the stories. Um, so he said, son, it's time to share. Everybody's in time. One mind, one spirit. That's it, guys. The fires of violence that have devastated far too many Aboriginal homes are being extinguished. Family by family, community by community, violence is being replaced by the warmth, 
safety, and love of the traditional home fire. I brought into this world six daughters, one son. I never did follow what they taught in that school. I chose to listen to the old ones, and I sobered up. And as I speak here, I have over like 50 grandkids, 20 great grandkids, been sober all those years. But one thing I'm grateful for as I sit here today talking, that I am still with my wife. You know, that I'm really grateful for, that she stood by me all these times. Take a wonderful person to ever stand, stand up to abuse like that, and to still stay with you. Hey, hey.